Good evening. Uh, before we start tonight, I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. When we start most meetings here in the Pacific Northwest where I reside, we like to acknowledge the people who came before us and honor them and their contributions to our society. So let's begin. I would like to acknowledge that the land we are gathering on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including from the East Coast, the Seneca, Pamunkey, Chincoteague, Seminole, and Susquehannock, and from the central part of the U.S., Comanche, Choctaw, Blackfoot, Denai, and Pawnee, and from the West Coast, the Coast Salish, the Chinook, Shasta, Paiute, and Shoshone. These are just a few of the approximately 820 federally recognized and non-recognized tribes across the U.S. These lands were stolen from living indigenous people who lived on these lands and protected these lands and the life on them. We need to protect and honor the history and people of these places and their innumerable contributions to our world as we look to improve the lives of all peoples, including the original peoples of this land. So I'd like to welcome you this evening. My name is Linda Tosti Lane and I am the uh, co-legislative coordinator for the Washington State National Organization for Women and uh, am also the current secretary for the First District uh, Democrats. I would like to welcome you uh, tonight to the uh, presentation on Made in the USA, the National Infrastructure Bank, which will fire up American manufacturing. And before we actually start the presentation, I'd like to do some housekeeping. Please remain muted during the presentation in order to preserve our bandwidth and not have distracting sounds while our uh, speakers are making their presentations. And there will be time at the end of the presentations for Q&A from the audience. Next slide. Before you is a list of our distinguished speakers. I'm not going to read them to you because I think that we, you all can do that yourselves and that we can actually also proceed. So what I'd like to do right now is introduce our first speaker, Alfaka Mutardi, a macroeconomist, uh, a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund in Fairfax, Virginia. Thank you very much and welcome to everybody this evening uh, on this really important discussion on how we can boost American manufacturing and build our infrastructure at the same time. So I'm gonna give you, uh, because I'm a macroeconomist, I'm gonna take my, uh, my rights and uh, give you a little macro overview of where manufacturing is right now uh, and uh, why it's been subject to decline and what the how the National Infrastructure Bank is set up to critically uh, address this problem uh, that no other policy is so far. So uh, for those of you who may have been with us before or, or don't know, we have a bill in Congress, uh, HR 3339, which would create a national infrastructure bank. And what it would do would be to provide up to $5 trillion in lending for infrastructure projects all across the country. And the reason for the size of this bank is because it should be able to cover all of the backlog of infrastructure projects we've accumulated over the last 60 or 70 years, plus meet un, uh, other unmet needs for critical high-speed rail, affordable housing, large water projects, and, and those kind of things. Uh, so the way the bank works uh, is uh, it will provide lo loans directly to owners of public infrastructure, like states, cities, counties, public authorities, which come in uh, to uh, uh, request a loan for their particular infrastructure needs. And then the, um, the uh, borrower would, would, uh, would assign a project manager to this uh, infrastructure project and loan, and that project manager would then contract out work to builders and manufacturing firms to get the actual work done. So uh, the, these uh, builders and uh, constructors will need lots of inputs, um, semi-manufactured and manufactured in order to get uh, infrastructure built and uh, all across the country for whatever kind of project it is, bridges, highways, uh, water pipes, broadband, internet, and a lot of those inputs must be produced in the United States. Uh, that's a requirement of the legislation. 
And then the, uh, so that's the uh, sort of the indirect way that the NIB promotes ma uh, manufacturing. And then if there's any perceived bottleneck or need that the private sector is not meeting, then the NIB can direct directly lend into uh, the, that kind of productive activity to unclog the bottleneck. So what I'm gonna to explain to you is that manufacturing is a critical enabler of our technical innovation, our productivity gains. It's a direct leader to economic growth and also development of our workforce. So we'll be getting a two for by fixing our infrastructure, using our domestic manufacturing and um, getting better innovation in our projects. Uh, next slide. So this is the sort of the history of American manufacturing. When you look at manufacturing jobs, as a percent of total jobs in our economy. They peaked in 1943 uh, um, uh, with the advent of World War II mobilization. And then they slowly waned off over time so that now they account for only 9% of jobs today. Uh, we've lost, uh, since 1997, we've lost 25% of our manufacturing firms and 4.5 million manufacturing jobs. So when you look at the actual level of jobs, uh, you can see this big decline uh, on the chart to your right uh, in the black line uh, when their number of jobs actually fell off quite sharply. Um, now the causes of decline are diff um, different, uh, different factors. They included the transfer of manufacturing jobs overseas, increased automation, for example, from robotics and that kind of thing on production lines, and the decline of US steel and coal industries. And then there was also this disruption from the financial crisis of 2000, uh, when the dot-com bubble burst and a lot of manufacturing firms decided to go financial rather than actually invest in our real economy. Now, cities and states have diversified over time as a result of this decline. Uh, some have gone to produce services, uh, including tourism and that kind of thing, or advanced manufacturing and high-tech industries, and other uh, cities attracted uh, industries to their area for the first time, including especially in the South, uh, where there are a lot of manu autom automobile manufacturers moved to. But by 2017, the U.S. was still the third largest industrial producer worldwide between, behind China and Euro, the European Union. Uh, but uh, that, that means that we're comparing only 20% of our GDP in the industrial sector compared to 40% for China. Uh, so uh, today's uh, manufacturing uh, is, accounts for a small percent of our GDP. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Uh, uh, could you go into the next slide? Right. So today, manufacturing accounts for 11% of our GDP and 8% of our dire direct employment, but it's still a critical driver of, of, of many things. It drives 20% of our nation's capital investment, 30% of our productivity gains, our economy becomes more efficient as a re result of this innovative production, 60% of our exports, and 70% of our business R&D. Um, the, it can be measured, uh, another way to look at manufacturing is to measure the value added of manufacturing that's consumed in the United States, uh, that is how much dollar value we add on by producing here uh, from domestic producers. Uh, it's only 70% for the U.S. compared to 90% from, uh, from China, and that just goes to show you that uh, even in the manufacturing center, sector, a lot of our imports uh, a lot of our manufacturing is uh, parts of it are imported and then put together uh, in the, in the uh, final uh, go round. Uh, ch computer chips are one example of um, an innovative sector that we used to have command of worldwide, but has been exported overseas. Uh, as a result, in 2021, Congress passed a CHIPS Act to promote research, development and fabrication of semiconductors or chips within the United States. Um, however, as of uh, right now, that uh, particular act, uh, while it's passed, has not gotten any funding, uh, including through the Department of Defense budget. So there are critical spillovers of manufacturing into the rest of the economy, like computer chips, like uh, supply chains. Uh, and the investment, the NIB investment will derive manufacturing and innovation, just like it did for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was the previous uh, public bank uh, to this proposal. So we could go to the next slide. 
So um, let's look at the inputs from, uh, from manufacturing that go into infrastructure projects. Well, we know the, the basics. We see them every day, concrete, uh, steel, aluminum, wool, stone, uh, asphalt. They can be at various levels of, of fabrication uh, before they go into an infrastructure project. And then you're also going to need all the trucks and earth moving equipment and cranes and, and dredgers and tunnel boring equipment uh, to install that infrastructure. And those manufacturing firms in turn will need manufacturing warehouses where they produce actually produce the goods and we'll need to train an up up to date workforce and then there'll be specialty items that infrastructure projects will require pumps and electronics and smart technologies machinery robotics uh, and site equipment like train sets or uh, water treatment plants uh, could be a whole uh, slew of things uh, this picture to the right of your screen shows uh, one particular example of an infrastructure project, which we're all familiar with. We drive by them every day, and that is uh, re-asphalting uh, uh, roads. Uh, we typically know that the asphalt is layered over concrete and gravel base. Uh, in this particular um, picture, uh, you, you might be surprised to know that that asphalt has uh, plastic chips mixed in with it. Uh, that recycle plastic waste. So that's an innovative use of how we can improve our technology. And then we need the workforce and we need all of this uh, mechanical equipment to actually lay the asphalt down. So that's just one example. So uh, one thing to note is that uh, infrastructure projects in the United States have been escalating the cost to install them has been escalating quite dramatically. Uh, that's out of line with uh, Europe and uh, the Far East. Uh, we, we cost us maybe five, five times as much to do infrastructure projects here uh, as compared to overseas. A lot of people have investigated the reasons for that. It's something we have to keep an eye on when we do our infrastructure projects. Uh, it's not due to unions or per unit labor or per unit construction material costs, uh, even though people cite those things. It seems to be really uh, due to a citizen voice and lawsuits coming out of the 1970 Environmental Protection Act uh, that, uh, that stop infrastructure projects in their track or expensive design changes and add-ons that are demanded in high income areas, such as big fancy flyovers for, for road projects. Uh, but it will be something that we'll, we'll want to use innovation to keep our infrastructure costs down to a very uh, minimum as possible. So if you go to the next slide. So to summarize, uh, there have been several programs uh, of the federal government to try and boost infrastructure. Uh, the first one actually was the uh, 1933 Buy American Act, which applies to uh, direct purchases of the federal government uh, that should have uh, should be domestically made. Uh, the, because the rule was being skirted around, it was strengthened in 2022 under uh, President Biden to ensure more domestic content uh, in these critical purchases. And then there was the Buy America set of rules, which apply to purchases of iron, steel, and other manufactured inputs that go into the construction projects, which the federal government finances. Uh, the, uh, uh, an act by Sherrod Brown was inserted into the recent bipartisan infrastructure bill to, uh, to, to strengthen up and reduce the number of waivers that were given for this iron and steel and other manufactured goods going into our infrastructure projects. And then of course there's made in the USA, which is a country of origin mark that is regulated by the, the Federal Trade Commission. And it indicates that a product is virtually or mostly made, domestically made, uh, although uh, that, that content can vary quite a bit. So um, th those are the state of play of things right now. Uh, we also have new bills that were introduced, a competition act um, that would need $100 billion from the US budget, doesn't have funding. Uh, Senator Coons proposed Industrial Finance Corporation Act, which would finance uh, manufacturing firms directly. Uh, that one also has not passed or received funding. So the, uh, the, the, the way that the National Infrastructure Bank uh, will work to boost all of these projects is by doubling the spending on uh, yearly infrastructure. Currently, we're spent about 400 billion a year on infrastructure and the manufacturing sector of our economy produces 2.3 billion in goods a year, much smaller. And uh, then some of those are infrastructure construction inputs. But now we're going to lend 
an additional $500 billion a year and demand even more manufacturing goods. And the bill requires that 100% of these are by America uh, with no waivers uh, permitted, permissible. And if uh, we see that there's a bottleneck or manufacturing that's not um, sufficiently um, low, low priced or um, available in the United States, then we'll actually lend into firms directly to produce those manufacturing goods. We require, of course, David of Basin wages. We ensure, we uh, encourage all construction firms and manufacturing firms to train up their workforce. Uh, and we, we can complement the language for manufacturing that's in the bipartisan bill. So keep in mind, we'll be able to do all of this, build manufacturing, stimulate our economy, uh, address, uh, you know, uh, use goods from our manufacturer setter, sector, all without federal spending, taxes, or debt. What's not to like about this great project? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfaka. Um, I meant to say this before we started speaking in is that because we do have a number of speakers i may in, interrupt some of the speakers tonight and I, and please so don't be offended if i ask you to spend up speed up your presentation because we'd like to be finished with all the speakers and question and answers by 6 30. so our next speaker is dr alexander metcalf uh who is the uh uh, president of Transportation Economics and Management Company and is an international expert in rail ports and supply chains from Frederick, Maryland. So Dr. Metcalf, it's your stage right now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if we could have the first slide. Okay, um, perhaps we can have the next slide. <clears throat> okay, this is the uh, high-speed rail network that uh, Thames has developed over the last 20 years, having worked on uh, various projects across the country. We have conducted more than 100 uh, intercity high-speed rail studies for both the federal government, for states, and for uh, local communities. And as a result of all that work, this is the network that we put together as a national network when the policy from Obama was to identify a network that would meet the needs of 80 to 90 percent of the U.S. population. Now, the main thing about this network is that we believe it is uh, essentially uh, financially and economically viable uh, if we can get the investment into the development of the system. Um, and basically, uh, when I began my career back in 1982, I was asked by the European community to say how much high-speed rail would be possible in America. And I wrote a nice paper saying none. And the reason was that the, for the difference between what we see today and what we had then is basically that conditions have dramatically changed in the US between 1970 and basically 2020. And the things that have changed that have made a huge difference to the viability of developing such a network are the following. Next slide. The first thing is that the demand for uh, rail ridership, intercity rail ridership, has been growing dramatically since 1970. Between 2000 and 2019, it grew by 50%. It's making more than 3% a year. And as a result, we have a, a really dramatic increase in ridership potential for high-speed rail. This isn't really recognized uh, by most people, and you can see that this is an Amtrak ridership forecast, which essentially has been based on a very low quality rail network, most of which is under 79 miles an hour, the only exception really being the Northeast Corridor. And you can see that the demand has simply gone up. On some of the intercity corridors, the growth is over 200%. And why is that? 
basically congestion in the air and on the highways and gas prices. Those are the two things that are driving people out of the car and onto rail. And at the moment, our rail network is a very inadequate, low quality network associated with Am Amtrak system. Next slide. At the same time as the uh, market for high-speed rail has been expanding dramatically, elsewhere in the world, the quality of train service and the speed of train service has increased dramatically. And whereas basically Amtrak, its average speed is something like, you know, 50 miles an hour, not competitive with the automobile, the new trains are capable of between 250 and 300 miles an hour, which means that the time associated with traveling by intercity rail has dramatically shrunk. It, it can be produced very, very uh, fast travel times between cities that are certainly in the range of uh, 200 to 800 miles apart. So improving high quality rail intercity systems and the fact that the cost of these uh, new vehicles are relatively low compared with the uh, increases in prices associated with other vehicles such as airplanes and automobiles. Next slide. Altogether, the other factors that are making the market much more attractive today than it was in the past are uh, the adoption of what is called the Japanese model. And the Japanese model is to say that a high-speed rail network can basically generate a lot of economic development due to transit or in development. This shows a picture for the Portland Rose Quarter that has been planned as the main station in Portland, Oregon, uh, uh, for basically a 250 mile an hour high-speed train service. Next slide. Another feature is express freight. The express freight market was pretty limited uh, back in the 70s and 80s. It was really a local activity and it wasn't really very well thought of. And most people left it to those guys with vans to do most of the freight movement. FedEx, UPS, and Prime have all moved into the market because it is growing so dramatically. The connection of express parcel markets with the IT systems that allow us to go on the web and basically order up all the stuff we want has, is being growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, basically, it's growing at about 15% a year. And that means the infrastructure that's required to move express freight has to be rebuilt, doubled every eight to 10 years, which is just a direct reflection of the e-commerce market with us all ordering parcels and having them sent all over the country, uh, going to our front doors and basically uh, giving us a very high quality service in terms of our retail purchases. Next slide. Okay, so basically what we've seen is these three markets uh, have, a, have grown and they're expanding the opportunity uh, associated with high-speed rail. Back in the 1980s, I could not see that high-speed rail in America could cover its operating costs, let alone make any contribution to capital costs. What we find today, and this is out of uh, the uh, 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 work that's recently been done for the Cascadia high-speed rail, is we can see that as we add each business to the total capital, uh, uh, to the uh, project, so an increasing proportion of capital costs can be covered. This creates the opportunity for public-private partnerships. And in fact, uh, the public sector is going to be able to pay easily 50 to 80% of the capital cost of the project. When you're talking about a $2 billion, a $20 billion project, like uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Boston, in, in Portland to Seattle, then basically what we're saying is that the, we're relieving the private sector, the uh, public sector of a lot of capital requirement. And at the same time, the private sector, provided it can borrow the money, 
And this is where the infrastructure bank comes in, will basically, because it's willing to take a lower risk profile, it basically would cover a lot of costs. So basically on the Portland Seattle corridor, where the, the Cascadia High Speed Rail Group are saying they can cover 50% of the $20 billion cost of putting in uh, a high speed rail system. Next slide. This slide simply shows that the private sector can cover the operating costs handsomely. If you look at the operating ratio, that is saying that the revenues that can be generated from those three businesses that have been put together to, in order for, for the high-speed rail would actually produce revenues that are 3.6 times greater than the operating cost of the system. So no subsidy. Legislatures hate subsidies. And what we're saying is that the Cascadia High Street Rail would not need any subsidy because it can easily cover its, its operating costs and make a contribution to capital costs, a very significant one. Next slide. Not only is it financially viable now for the Cascadia High Street Rail Corridor, but the economic benefits that come from it, particularly that on the demand side, are very significant. You can see the yellow block telling you that basically uh, $26 billion of additional economic growth can be added to the Portland to Seattle corridor simply by building the, 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 the high-speed rail option. Next slide. Okay, so if we look at the uh, supply side and we look at the industrial character of the American economy, what we find out is that there's a new economy which is uh, expanding and growing very rapidly. If you look at the slide, you can see the blue at the bottom, the darker blue, 30% of the market is in professional services. And on top of that, there is the financial services sector, which adds another 5.2. And IT is adding 1.7%. So basically we've got 40% of the economy in those big uh, professional services growth areas, which are driving and which are very interested in having high-speed rail systems. And essentially what we're seeing is that in addition, accommodation and food services are expanding and they're all part of that TOD. And on top of that, we have basically construction, which is 17% of the economy. You can see at the top in the old economy, the very thin slice that is today, the old manufacturing areas, whether it's metal, plastic, chemical, or other manufacturing, it only adds up to a very small percent as uh, uh, Alpha, Al Flecker was able to show in the new economy. The 19.4% in orange is in fact largely made up of agricultural products. So the old economy is basically a very small part today, 30%, uh, while 70% is in these new businesses that are growing and expanding rapidly. But if we want to go to basically a build a new high-speed rail network for America, let's go to the next slide. And what we see is that the new economy, uh, such as you know, the, in that middle picture, we show you the Apple campus that's being built. The new economy is growing very rapidly. Uh, FedEx, Prime, and uh, UPS are all growing very, very rapidly. And as a result, they run the biggest air forces, the big, uh, biggest air, have more airplanes than just about anybody else in, in the US. In moving parcels, is the wave of the future. And as our economy grows between now and 2050, we can expect a 60 to 80% expansion in that business. And so we'll be really growing that whole sector. Uh, the express parcels, as we say, eight to 15% a year. And that business can add 40% to basically high-speed rail revenues. The traditional economy is in, is of course, steel, plastics, engineering of vehicles, uh, and we need those inputs to, to develop the new high-speed rail network. Okay, and finally, can we go to the next slide? 
what we see is here are the key inputs for the traditional inputs. If we were to put that network that we showed at 15,000 miles, we would need 30,000 miles of track because it's a double track system. What we see is we need 7.5 million tons of steel. We need 1,500 trains, which is 30,000 locomotives and 12,000 coaches. That would keep uh, the uh, vehicle industry busy for at least five to 10 years building all that rolling stock. Ties, you'd need 15 million cubic yards of concrete, which is huge. Ballast, we need 60,000 tons a mile, but basically that's 180 million tons. And in terms of stations, we need a thousand stations, which probably will cost us something like $500 billion to actually build. But again, we need the private sector in order to help us uh, generate all that TOD revenue. Uh, next slide. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Metcalf, for that um, very informative uh, presentation. Our next speaker is Senator William Tallman from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for in inviting me and uh, giving me an opportunity to share some information about what's uh, going on in uh, New Mexico, uh, which is really not very positive. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So water. We, a uh, state engineer who recently uh, quit because he was uh, very upset because he wasn't receiving um, enough resources. He claims uh, that we need two and a half billion dollars to bring our water infrastructure up to speed and to correct all the problems. As you can see on the far right um, column, we're only getting 355 million which is only one sixth of what the state engineer says, says, says we need. Uh, a lot of experts are saying that we could spend 1.1 trillion, which is the total amount of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that was signed by Biden in mid-November. We could spend all of that 1.1 million just on 1.1 trillion just on water infrastructure. So power. Uh, New Mexico is the third, uh, the second sunniest state in the country and one of the top five windiest. So we have a lot of potential to produce uh, renewables. But I guess as you can see, we're getting zero, zero money uh, in connection uh, with that. We need to uh, put a little bit more on that later. Broadband, we have, depending on who you talk to, we have tw uh, 20 to 25 percent of our residents without um, either they don't have uh, accessible or they can't afford it. Uh, it's been estimated that we're going to receive uh, one, uh, only $100 billion, and we need one and a half to $2 billion. So obviously, we're far short. But however, in all fairness, there are some uh, federal grants available. However, they would max out at maybe a, a billion. So still leaving a shortfall of one and a half to one billion dollars. Housing. See, you can see we're receiving zero money for housing. Uh, rents in Albuquerque have gone up 38 percent in the last since the onset of the pandemic. One of the highest in the country. So obviously, that um, is one of the major reasons why we have one of the uh, highest rates of homelessness in, in the country. It's a huge problem, is almost uh, daily uh, front page news. Um, a recent survey of uh, residents indicated that 43% fear e eviction, which is 8% uh, higher than, than the 35% national average. So we are in a dire need of, of housing, and yet we're getting no money. Um, it's uh, the, the median price of a single family house has almost doubled in the last 10 years 
from 175,000 to 340,000. So no good news on uh, housing. Uh, next, well, and um, there's no, there, you can go back, well, it's fine. There's no, nothing on, on roads and bridges, but let me just say 73 cents of every dollar Mexico is gonna get is going for roads and bridges. Now you can make a good argument, that's not our highest priority. So I asked a friend of mine who's very knowledgeable about um, the goings on in Congress. And I said, it sound, looks to me like the highway contractors and the auto manufacturers had their had a lot of input on this. And he, he says, you're right. Well, he doesn't go there anymore because it takes longer to get in the building, in the Capitol building, than the length of your meeting. So that's, uh, so that's, uh, oh, and also a meeting yesterday at the Capitol, uh, we were told by the infrastructure czar, he's been a highly capable individual, has been hired to oversee uh, all this um, money that we're getting from the feds. And I asked him, uh, did, did the feds seek any uh, any input from uh, New Mexico on how, how the money was gonna be allocated? And he said, uh, absolutely not. So I guess he who has the uh, money it makes all the decisions. So that that certainly, uh, so like I said, obviously 73 cents of every dollar is way too much. Maybe maybe 50% would be okay. So that's just that much less money for our other critical needs of housing, broadband, power, and water infrastructure. Next slide, please. Well, here we have, uh, well, getting more, what I talked about earlier really, really wasn't what I'm supposed to be talking about. So here's some, I guess the uh, the thrust of this meeting is uh, what just how manufacturing will be uh, affected. So obviously when you're spending trillions of dollars, you're obviously gonna um, spend a, a lot of money on uh, all kinds of things. Doc, Dr. Medcloff had an excellent slide showing how, how the breakdown goes. But broadband, um, as I said, we need a billion dollars, um, which is in addition to the 100 million plus other, other federal grants available. And that would be used, uh, as you can see, for trucks, earth moving equipment, cement and steel, and telecom equipment. Uh, wastewater and drinking water. Um, well, as I said before, the state engineers said we needed two and a half billion. Um, although, since there doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency, it will probably be four or five billion dollars by the time we get around to to constructing uh, all these. Uh, things that we need as uh, the, uh, the water, um, we, we're in a drought here, severe drought. We've only had eight tenths of one, eight point eight one inches in the first four months of this month. So we're in a severe drought. We have five forest fires. This is uh, unheard of to have forest fires this early in the year. Usually they don't start till maybe late May or June. So all the experts are predicting a, uh, a very, uh, a, 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 this is a fire season uh, like we've never had before. Senator so, Coleman, uh, I hate to ask you if you could speed it up. Oh, yes, I'd be glad to. Thank you. So as you can, Oh, okay. Uh, well, just a real quick word on um, high-speed rail. It, it, Dr. Medkoff showed a, a map, and the only uh, there's only two lines, high-speed lines, going from the Mississippi River to the West Coast. One of them's going through Albuquerque, Phoenix, and on to LA, and the other one is Denver, Salt Lake City, on to to uh, to uh, San Francisco. So you would think, and and the, the line through uh, through Albuquerque is busier than, than the Northern route. So you would think that we would get some money because that line would be one of the first to be built and we're getting zero. I've been to China twice. The infrastructure over there would blow your mind. People don't realize in America how far behind we are. China has got 
depending on who you talk to, 23 to 30,000 miles of high speed rail, we've only got, we got zero. Trains don't go any faster now than they did 100 years ago. Um, unbelievable. And so that's a critical need. And we don't seem to be making much progress. 14 years ago, the voters of California approved a high speed line. In the last 15 years, over the same, China has built 23 to 30,000 miles. So we're 10, 20, 30 um, years behind China and Europe. Um, Europe spends 5% of their GMP on, uh, on infrastructure. China spends 8%. We spend a, a measly 2%. And um, so this slide here shows we, we have, uh, as I said, we need to construct uh, desalinization, there's no money for that. And we need to construct uh, long distance pipelines bringing water from the Midwest and the uh, South and the Mississippi River in the Midwest. And some people even say we need to bring it as far as the East Coast. So, but there is a project in Eastern or Western, uh, um, Western New Mexico. It's costing, as you can see there, 1.7 billion over to build and construct a 300 mile project to bring water up into uh, the northwestern part of, of, uh, of New Mexico, which includes uh, most of the uh, Navajo Nation, which overlaps into Arizona. Um, but that's only about, we're only talking about two to 300,000 people. It's gonna cost, you know, terrific amount of money just to do that. So this is just a, a, a trickle. Um, excuse the pun, a trickle of money that is needed to, uh, to improve and upgrade and expand our water infrastructure. So the last picture, well, I asked for a picture of a water truck, but this is what I'm gonna have to settle for. I was hoping for a picture of a water tank because my point is in America, we don't seem to get motivated to do anything, any big projects until there's a crisis. So I'm suggesting here that we're not gonna really get serious about this water infrastructure and a lot of other infrastructure problems until we start hauling water into, um, in large quantities in, into our major cities and, and towns. So that's, uh, thank you for listening. That's all I have and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Senator Tallman. Um, our next speaker tonight is uh, Steve Rubuffo, who's the port director uh, from the Port of Alaska in Anchorage. Um, Mr. Rubuffo? All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Linda. I'll, I'll leave my uh, camera turned off for this. And I hope the transport of the slides into the uh, in your format hasn't changed much of anything. Mm -hmm. In the interest of time, I'm going to forego a lot of the why behind what you know what I'm going to show you this evening, and stick to the you know, stick to the reason why we're all here today. But if uh, you have questions about the why later, I'm happy to go into that detail. You'll hear a little, but uh, but but I'll I'll forego too much of it. Next slide. So, in the context of our discussion, I want to talk about our Port of Alaska modernization program. Uh, we have a billion dollar plus initiative underway to replace 100% of the marine terminal infrastructure here at the port uh, because we are 60 plus years old and the level of corrosion uh, because of these high latitude environment that we, you know, that we live in uh, is about to render large portions of the dock uh, unable to continue to, to uh, bear the load bearing strength uh, that we need to support the commerce mission that we support up here in the state for not only uh, feeding people, but for the Department of Defense and uh, and the desire of the state and the feds for us to be around should there be a disaster response and recovery requirement. Uh, we have band-aided this place for as long as we ha as long as we can. Uh, the next big step must be demolish it and replace it, and uh, and that's what we're that's what we're underway doing right now. Next slide, please. 
But if you live in Alaska and you're trying to explain why you've got a billion dollar project to people, you've got to appreciate the fact that in all of the history of the state, nobody has ever had to come out of pocket to pay for infrastructure. You know, we went, you know, we've had oil and, you know, oil and gas booms as a consequence of, uh, of the Prudhoe Bay oil fines and the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and years and years and years of, of money in the state legislature to fund all kinds of capital projects. And, uh, and for a while there, we had uh, quite a bit of uh, throw weight in Washington, D.C. with Senator Ted Stevens and his partnership with uh, Senator Dan Inouye from Hawaii and, and how they ran, uh, you know, how they ran the financing there. Uh, a lot of money came into Alaska and a lot of infrastructure that was built and not very much of it, if any, came out of the pockets of Alaskans. Well, the, the world has changed and now stuff costs. And now they want to know how come stuff costs. So one of the things we have to do is explain to them just how big this port is that we're replacing. So we threw this little graphic together to kind of give people an appreciation for, you know, ports are not just what you see above the water. There's a lot of it that's below the water. And there's a lot that has to go in to what it is you do below the water so that that which stays above the water stays above the water. So this is, uh, you know, this is a true portrayal of what it is we're trying to do here and what it takes in this environment to replace a port and construct it to modern, you know, to modern standards and, uh, and keep it a viable part of commerce for the state. Next slide. So the first order of business was to construct what we call the petroleum cement terminal. And I can tell already that the, the uh, Pyrotechnics aren't working. So let's go to the next slide. And there it is, you know, there's that cement dome that you saw in the previous picture. For year one of the construction uh, was to put this trestle and platform in place. Next slide. And this is what it, uh, year two was to, was to put out there the mooring dolphins and the breasting dolphins and the, the hose tower infrastructure and the control infrastructure and all the plumbing. And uh, this was the end of this construction season. For those of you that don't spend a lot of time in Alaska, uh, this is November. And it, it's worthwhile showing a picture of what we have to build to deal with um, up, up here in Alaska. So get an appreciation for, uh, for what the dock looked like about a month and a half after the contractor buttoned up and, uh, and went away for the winter. But we are two months or less away from basically cutting the ribbon and, uh, and, and getting this thing uh, fully functional and in the business for us. Next slide, please. It's a thing of beauty. And if you, and if you live up here, it's the first piece of new, new dock infrastructure at this port in over 20 years. I wanted to show you what our plan of finance was to build this, because this is important to, it kind of gives you a, a deep dive into our psyche, if you will. Uh, whenever we go to Juneau and talk about our, you know, talk about our program and ask the state legislator to support uh, to support us, they want to know, well, what's your plan of finance? So we we can show them what we've done and been successful with in, in the past. And you can see from this, there's an, uh, you know, there's a smattering of of state bonds, uh, state grants, uh, which are what they've set aside for us in their capital programs in the years they've done it. Uh, there was a state general obligation bond in 2013, uh, of which you know 50 million of that asked to the voters uh, came to the port. Uh, we got another state uh, capital grant in 2019. We've been successful uh, in, in in a small degree, to up to 45 million dollars uh, going through the PIDP and build programs, uh, the you know the federal grant programs that have been you know plussed up thanks to IAJA or IIJA. And uh, we threw in some port equity and we went to the banks and borrowed $20 million to take us over the finish line. And this is an important piece and, and a lesson that we're trying to teach Alaskans right now. It was $20 million for this piece of infrastructure. That was just happened to be a tenth of what the total cost of that program was. Yeah. It's going to it's going to need to be a significant percentage higher going forward, without any state support or failing to compete successfully for what's in the IAJA. 
And next slide. And what is coming next is uh, everything that you see in the 10 o'clock section uh, of, this, of this graphic here. It is the cargo docks and the second of our two uh, petroleum docks that need to be replaced. Next slide. Cost figures that are associated with that and the pieces parts that uh, you know that have to be that have to be finished uh, amounts to uh, about 1.2 billion dollars for that second phase to do to do all those cargo docks and uh, and then we have to do a little cleanup of some uh, seismically unstable land out there at the north end of our port that's going to be uh, that final 134 million dollars that can stand to wait. Uh, more years than the rest of this can, but uh, 1.2 billion dollars is uh, is what we're going to need within the next uh, eight to ten years to finish this, and uh, that would be you know either all from the banks or all with that mix plan of finance if we're able to make that happen. And I think the next slide is my next to last slide, and uh, and Stuart asked us to put together what do we think the the array of, of specialties that are, that are gonna be required to do this will be. And uh, you know, I, I'm sure I've missed a few, but uh, these are the kinds of trades and these are the kinds of expertise that I've seen here over the course of the last two years building that one petroleum dock. And this is, a, uh, you know, this is an effort that's gonna take you know, eight to 10 years to finish because of our very short construction seasons and how far we are away from where the sources of supply are, uh, that is there's gonna be made more challenging with Buy America and Buy American, um, especially if we're gonna get money, you know, go to the infrastructure bank for this, or even if we go to the uh, federal grant programs. So I, I guess the lesson, you know, the lesson learned for all of you about those of us that are on the asking end of that kind of money is if you're asking for federal money from IAJA, you already know the game. And you already know the dance, and uh, so we're not. You're not asking us to learn anything new. Uh, we just have to add that to the list of, you know, potential sources of of financing that we're going to have to uh, make these arrangements with. Okay, next slide. And uh, that's that is it for me. And we can move on to the uh, next speaker, Linda, or I can answer a couple questions now. Uh, actually, we're going to ask have, save the questions for the very end. All right, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, good. Our, thank you for your time. And uh, our next speaker is Steven Fenberg, who is an Emmy award-winning author and producer of Unprecedented, Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good, and Brother Can You Spare a Billion from Houston, Texas. Good evening. I'm glad to be here tonight to tell everybody that infrastructure banks work. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation was the first New Deal agency and it was started by Republican President Herbert Hoover. He understood that he had to embrace the power of government to solve the catastrophe of the Great Depression. He did so in his last year of office. President Roosevelt embraced the RFC. He made Jesse Jones its chairman and they supercharged it. And through spending, not, excuse me, through lending, not spending, they saved thousands upon thousands of homes, farms, banks, and businesses throughout the nation. There's been a lot of talk about rail. The RFC helped rails, railroads refinance their debt and used loans to help them modernize their lines and develop the latest in high-speed trains. The railroads at the time were one of the largest employers in the nation and one of the largest taxpayers. And it revitalized the rails. It laid the infrastructure for mobilization that was later to come. And without these early investments by the RFC, it would have been very difficult to move troops and equipment around as was needed in the 1940s. The RFC also brought electricity to rural America when 80% of the people still lived in the dark. And then it helped them buy appliances on credit so they could plug into the modern age. Those same strategies can be used today to help people retrofit their homes so they're energy efficient, storm resistant, and wired for the digital age. It can spread 
broadband throughout the nation. And all of these depression era infrastructure bank programs worked. Industrial output doubled during FDR's first four years in office. And Detroit was churning out more cars in 1936 than it had in 1929. And this is all while war is spreading in Europe. Then the RFC converted its focus from domestic economics to global defense. And when Germany invaded Poland in September of 1939, the United States Armed Forces ranked 17th in the world. Our army was tiny. We had no equipment to speak of. We had 2,500 airplanes and they were mostly left over from World War I, whereas Germany had 9,000 planes and Japan had 7,500. Even so, within months, the United States was poised to become the world's arsenal of democracy after Congress passed legislation that allowed the RFC to build, buy, or convert plants to increase the nation's armed might and to begin acquiring strategic materials from the, around the world, most specifically tin and rubber. And again, these strategies can be adapted today when we're talking about computer chips or we're talking about rare earth materials that are so essential for our modern equipment today. The RFC, 18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, began building thousands of plants across the nation to build the tanks, trucks, ships, and airplanes that were required to fight and win World War II. And its efforts were comprehensive. It manufactured the high octane gas that was necessary to fuel the planes. It built schools to train the aviators to fly them. It uh, cornered the market in silk and wool for uniforms and parachutes. The United States government through the RFC owned all of this industrial capacity and leased these, mag these huge plants to corporations to operate. And the magnitude was unprecedented. For instance, the largest plant in the world was built by the RFC. It was 140 acres large. Raw metal could come in at one end and a finished airplane engine would come out at the other. And I'm saying all this to, to show this has all been done before. All we need to do is look at successes from the past for solutions today, because all of the things that the RFC did during the Great Depression and World War II can be adapted today to revitalize our nation, to vaccinate the world, to combat climate change, to re-industrialize our manufacturing base. So take a look at the RFC as a model for encouragement, inspiration, as we embrace the power of good government to reinitiate something like the RFC in a new infrastructure bank today. Thank you. Thank you. I that was good timing. <laughs> Our next speaker is oh, five minutes. I tried my best. You did. You met it. <laughs> uh, so we'll go on to our next speaker, who's Representative Eddie Day Paschinski from the Pennsylvania House out of Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Hi, everybody. We there? Okay. Well, this is my last event for today. Uh, I just had uh, three before this. So I missed most of it, but I know it was exciting. As you can see uh, on your screen, I'm State Rep. Eddie Day Pashinsky, and I'm a proud sponsor, along with my colleagues, uh, of House Resolution 113. We have close to 50 sponsors right now because we are in complete support of the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, you know, if we want to build uh, these bridges and uh, the roads and uh, our rail, we have to make sure we also have steel companies that can produce all the steel that we need. And I, I know Randy Brightbill is on, on, the, um, on the, uh, the session here today, who's a great steel worker, so he can uh, butt in any time he wants. But the bottom line is Pennsylvania used to have some great steel companies in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and also in Bethlehem. And the National Infrastructure Bank, I'm sure that was stated before, and I just heard um, um, uh, Mr. Feinberg give that history. I feel, and I think most of us that support this National Infrastructure Bank, feel the time is right again. 
this is a time when we're now facing what appears to be even a world war, which is crazy. Who would have ever thought in 2022 that we'd be seeing this? We're now having to produce more equipment. It's now having to produce more uh, tanks and, and equipment like that. But more than that, if we're gonna build the roads and the bridges that we say we need, and we're gonna build the, the rail that we need, we have to make sure we also improve our manufacturing. And that is of course of steel. Uh, the example that is uh, out there before you, big deal now is on this uh, stainless steel, the seamless rolled ring, which is that large uniquely shaped outer casing to act as the containment vessel for nuclear. It's amazing the kind of scientific advances that have been put forward. And as you can see in this, there are three specialty steel forgers in the country right now in the Western Hemisphere, and that's in PA, Illinois, and Wisconsin. These companies uh, are fully integrated, manufacture of large nuclear grade steel, and that's here in uh, the United States, Western Hemisphere. Why do we need this stuff? They're finding and inventing new discoveries of how to create power without the huge plants. And these are the kinds of things that are needed. Uh, Pennsylvania is definitely uh, ready for new uh, the revitalization of the Bethlehem Steel in Pittsburgh. We just need the what? We need the money. And where are we going to get the money? We're going to get the money from the National Infrastructure Bank. Private money, no taxes. We're going to pay um, Davis Bacon wages. We're going to hire more than 25 million Americans. And we can do that if we have the investment. The slide that you see now is the steel plants in Arkansas and in Virginia. I can tell you that Arkansas and Virginia are very excited to have them because it is definitely thousands of jobs. Pennsylvania, again, could become that center for steel making as we were in the early 1900s. That's Bethlehem and in Washington. Steel making in Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. As you can see, this was one of the early sites. It's located near the Lehigh River. It's near Allentown and Bethlehem. And these canals connected this industry way back when. None of us were around in order to transport the iron and the materials in order to produce the steel. Those canals and roads, as you could see, were financed by the Second Bank of the United States. That was under President John Quincy Adams. It's amazing how life goes. But I can tell you, I feel it because Pennsylvania is going to be reaching its 250th birthday anniversary. Our country will be achieving the 250th birthday in four more years. Pennsylvania was that keystone state. We would love to have Pennsylvania lead the charge once again to incite everyone to invest in this particular legislation, House Bill 3339, get your senators and your congressmen to make sure they support this. Because with that money, we could do all these things. We just missed the slide about Wharton. I don't know if you've heard about the Wharton School, one of the very famous schools in the Philadelphia area. He was also a leader in the steel industry when he met with President Lincoln way back when. None of us ever did see that, but I can tell you, I feel the same thing. It's time for this incredible program. We're not inventing something new. We're just having to revise it to be able to fit in 2022. That's what we're trying to do here. And that money is what we need in order to incite the investment of the private, uh, private uh, folks to invest back by our federal bonds. That money can rebuild this country. Pennsylvania is no different than anybody else. Pennsylvania has 48,000 miles of highway, incredible amount of water, over 4,000 uh, bridges, and about 3,000 need repair. Our roads need repair. We don't have rail. If we had rail, that would ease the pressure on our highways. So you see, all of this is needed. And of course, our winners here in Pennsylvania are unique. You heard Alaska talk about uh, the short building period that they have. Well, 
frost, cold, hot, frost, cold, hot, creates holes in the road <laughs> and messes up our bridges and stuff. So we need this NIB to work soon. By the way, one more thing, broadband. That's the latest thing. If we don't have connectivity, we can't connect people, we can't make money, we can't improve the lives. So I'm very happy that you included me on this. I'm very proud to support it. I'll go anywhere, anytime and promote the National Infrastructure Bank of the United States of America, sponsored by Roosevelt. Sp <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting a little carried away. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Representative Dupashinsky. Uh, uh, Assemblyman uh, Robert Karabinchik is, is here now, so I will turn it over to him. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, obviously, the infrastructure bank is so, so important to not each one of our states, but to, to our nation and as a whole. Uh, if you go to the next slide, go to the next slide. There you go. One of the things that, that we are looking at is what we call cleaning the grid. Obviously, our state of New Jersey and across this nation, we're looking to increase our solar, our wind, wave, geothermal energies, which is the clean energy targets, which are gonna help us in the future. However, the infrastructure bank could be a fundamental part of the funding for this all across our nation. There's opportunities for foreign banks, foreign companies, or domestic companies, all to increase their customer base. This is extremely important. One of the other parts that ties this clean energy all together is the manufacturing uh, of long-term storage batteries. This is part of our electrical grid system where we would be able to store the energy and then release it as needed so we could take care of uh, consumer energy during the high need uh, periods of time during the day. And obviously the last thing is decarbonizing or building stock. The NIB could help building owners to make energy efficient improvements of their existing structures and eliminate the site of fossil fuel. This is, and is fundamental and it's coming. No matter how we think about it, it is our future. If you go to the next slide, where we talk about moving freight, as some of the other speakers said, the USDOT estimates that the intermodal freight will total more than 33.7 billion metric tons by 2035. That's an enormous amount of, of product that's being moved. Our foreign imports and exports will double over the next two years. Our air freight will also increase and allow more manufacturers to quickly reach our customers across the nation and really across the globe. And funding improvements to our rail as the previous speaker said, our rails, our roads, our seaports, our airports are essential. And the NIB can do this in each one of our states and across our nation. If you go to the next slide, broadband is, is a part of this, which gives rise to smart manufacturing. It will be increasing our efficiency and safety in our manufacturing processes and plants by connecting equipment and improving system monitoring. Our autonomous robots, automated reality, design, cloud computing, waste reduction, and system integration will become a fundamental part of all of our manufacturing plants across this nation. That, and this is just, the, just on the manufacturing side. This will help every single person who's listening to this and all of our constituents everywhere in every state. And the last slide is in New Jersey. We have Paulsboro Marine Terminal, which is something that's being built right now. And this is for our wind turbines. 
and our towers that will be supporting that. The lower Alloway wind port is an area where we're gonna be building the turbines. This is just two manufacturing places that are just being built today. Atlantic City Airport and the FAA Flight Center. We're looking to expand this so that we would be able to bring more product in in different places. And obviously the most important thing is to have our airports increase and have a better safety program in place for all of the uh, excessive flights that are, will be coming in. And the NIB, again, will be a fundamental part of this. Without the NIB, as was previously stated, we're going through the old way of trying to find money to put debt on our books. And that's the old way of doing things. We need to change. And I am a big supporter of the NIB. I will do anything. And I've been talking to people. I was on a conversation earlier today explicitly about the NIB. And it's, and it's gaining support from the people that I'm talking to once they understand what it's about and what it could do for our states and for our nation. Um, so I am so happy to be able to just take a few minutes and talk about this. Thank you so much. And I'm here for you anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Karabinchik. Well, our next speaker is Julie Olson. She is a small business owner and chair of the Progressive Caucus and in the Alaska Democratic Party from Anchorage, Alaska. And her small business is actually serves both Washington State and Alaska. Julie. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, well, thanks everyone. Th uh, thanks for being here and thanks for having me. Uh, I am here uh, tonight to talk about work workforce development. Uh, so we've heard a lot tonight from the various speakers about how we're gonna create um, uh, new manufacturing opportunities, bring back manufacturing to the US, which which I think is extremely important for the security and future of our country. Um, we've talked about the infrastructure projects, the construction, the engineering, uh, all of these projects that we're gonna build and how we're gonna provide millions of good paying middle-class jobs that will revitalize our economy. Now, some of you might be asking yourselves, where are those workers gonna come from? Because today across the country, many businesses like mine, large businesses, small businesses we're facing, uh, challenges in terms of hiring people. Uh, you may in your community see the hiring signs at Wendy's, at your hairdresser, at the Home Depot store, right? Everybody's looking for workers. So right now we're facing that challenge of not having enough workers. And um, why is that? Well, there's a, a lot of factors that are playing into that. So uh, we have COVID, the pandemic. A lot of people are still staying home and out of the workforce because of the pandemic. They may be uh, taking care of um, uh, ill family members or have immunocompromised family members. So they're staying out of the workforce. We've had a, nearly a million people die in the United States from COVID and many people suffering from uh, the effects of long COVID. Um, in addition to that, uh, the growth rate in the United States, population growth rate has been declining over the past several decades and in fact, actually flatlined in 2021. Over the last two years of the pandemic, uh, many uh, people in the baby boomer generation have taken retirement. Um, however, uh, many people are totally unprepared financially for retirement because social security for many of those people is simply not enough to live on. However, those people may not have the ability to do a physically taxing job and may very well not have the skills to move into the jobs in the new economy that we've heard about here tonight. Uh, and then of course, in addition to that, there's the lack of childcare and uh, which is forcing many people to stay out of the workforce because they don't have that ability to uh, have uh, childcare, quality childcare for their children. So uh, the National Infrastructure Bank has the potential to be transformational for our economy and for our society because part of the National Infrastructure Bank is to make that investment in uh, support 
and training so that we will be able to prepare the workforce uh, for those jobs of the future. So just a, a couple things to think about here is that, that um, uh, by providing high quality training programs and workforce development programs, we'll be able to provide a, uh, a career path for high school graduates that does not involve going to a four-year college. So those high school graduates might be able to go to a technical training program, like some of the, the items that you see listed in the slide here, and uh, would be able to, in, in a relatively short amount of time, get the training that would enable them to get a good paying, high tech type job in manufacturing. Uh, in addition, uh, there's been a lot of talk about automation. I think everyone's heard about driverless trucks and driverless uh, cabs and so on and so forth. And um, you know, one of the and uh, let's also bring coal into the picture uh, again as a, a part of the old economy. And one of the concerns is always, well, if we have um, automation and if we are going to uh, the new uh, new energy sources, renewables that don't involve coal, what are those workers going to do? Well, we need to provide the training programs that will allow them to gain the skills to fully participate in the new economy and help build this infrastructure for the future. Um, another uh, potential labor pool are people who have a, a criminal record who are coming out of our uh, jails and prisons with um, uh, a, a negative mark against them. And it's very challenging oftentimes for those people to become fully employed. And uh, without a job, uh, obviously you're unable to, uh, to rent an apartment or get a car or pay your insurance and, and that type of thing. So um, providing these educational opportunities for that pool of people, again, is gonna yield very high societal benefits as we reduce recidivism for that uh, population. So uh, the point is, is that it's gonna be very important uh, as part of the National Infrastructure Bank to make sure that we're able to provide the investment in things like you see here, union apprenticeship programs, uh, federally financed training programs. Uh, there are a variety of community workforce development programs. Um, here in Anchorage, for example, there's a program that will um, take people who have been out of the workforce for a while, place them with employers and subsidize their salary for a, a short period of time, like a six month period of time, while the employer trains them for those skills uh, that they would need to be successful in the new economy. Uh, community college technical degrees. Uh, on the Kenai Peninsula, Kenai Peninsula Community College here in Alaska, they have an excellent technical training program for workers in the oil field. And so this has really enabled a lot of young people, here, young people and older people who are looking for a career change to go through their training program and then get high paying skills uh, in the oil field. And then of course, career and technical education, a lot of cities and communities around the country uh, have those kinds of programs already and we need to expand those and make those available so we are able to train the workers that we will need to build these infrastructure projects. Julie, Next slide. Can, Julie, can we speed up? I'm speeding. Next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, and so here, um, just again, a, a few ideas on uh, some of the opportunities that are available registered apprenticeships. So uh, certainly we appreciate the programs that unions are putting on. We'd like to be able to expand those to rapidly give people the skills in uh, the construction trades. Uh, industry partnerships. So many large um, industries today have training programs and it would great, be great to be able to expand those down to our medium size and even small employers to be able to train uh, individuals in the, the skills that they'll need to take part in the new economy. And then uh, a final example here is uh, Pennsylvania's Keystone Development Partners, which is uh, a nonprofit and as you can see links employers and unions, etc, to provide training. So uh, lots of opportunity here and I think it should give uh, the people of America hope for the future that that you will that they will be able to take part and we can provide the training to allow them to fully participate in the economy of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, we now have two additional speakers. Uh, first of all, Mary Jane Shimsky, who's a New York County uh, legislator. And we would like, you know, if you can make your uh, comments brief because we are, it is now 6.20 my time, uh, would be 9.20 uh, East Coast time. Uh, so. 
first of all, Mary Jane. Uh, thank you very much, Linda. I will make this very, very brief. Um, we cannot continue bringing basic building materials and so on three quarters of the way around the world. Um, it's not environmentally sustainable and it does not make sense in terms of economic development. You need a broad complement of jobs, including manufacturing. We still use manufactured goods, but how much can you ship across the Pacific Ocean? I think it really is time for us to um, develop more of this manufacturing capacity back at home again. And of course, one of the great vehicles for doing it is the National Infrastructure Bank. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. Um, our next speaker will be Randy Bechtal, who's a steel worker and, the, and a union president from Pennsylvania. Hi, I just want to tell you a quick, I've got uh, three different steel manufacturers in my union local 4907 in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're all getting older. One was an original Bethlehem plant that's still using the same equipment that makes wire rope, which we're going to need a lot of that for the bridges and everything else. Uh, they need a new furnace. The money's not there. Uh, we have other ones that uh, re remanufactures uh, rail, steel rail. And they are, their complement is they, from having a thousand, they've got like 80 people working there. There's so much, there's so much people, so much here that we can re retrofit these places and we can put, put people back to work making a decent wage instead of sitting around getting bored and then getting into trouble, getting on drugs, whatever, get the people working again. We're ready for it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, it's now your time. Uh, it's for questions and answers. Uh, so we're going to be using the raise hand feature. Because I have, there are so many of us here, I cannot see everyone on my screen. And to be fair, I will only be recognizing those who use the raise hand feature. So if you don't know how to use it, on the bottom of your computer screen on the Zoom, it should have a place called Reactions. If you click on there, there will be a drop down that says raise hand, and I will recognize the people as they come across on my screen. Uh, thank you. So the first person is Roger Meadows. Have, how you doing? Have we found a um, sponsor in the uh, U.S. Senate yet? For, for you know, HR triple three nine. Uh, this is Alfeka Mutardi. Not yet. Uh, we, we are actively looking. If, if anyone on this call has uh, um, close relations with their senator, and you can make a case for this National Infrastructure Bank in every single uh, state, uh, just let the coalition know. And uh, what, what these senators respond to is hearing from their constituents uh, and organizing calls. Uh, to And we can come on the calls to uh, discuss how the National Infrastructure Bank works. We have had, had several successful calls with Sen senatorial offices, um, a lot of good bites and nibbles, but so far we're we're still looking for a senator uh, to um, to introduce the same legislation. All right. Next question. Uh, Robert Chase. Yes, I think uh, Eddie Pashinsky said that this would be funded by private money, and yet I thought that the Federal Reserve would create five trillion and. Put it out there so are they selling bonds like you know during the wartime bonds or to support this or how is that done so i can take that question also if you like uh this is a mixed ownership bank uh it is uh, uh incorporated under the u.s government corporations act but it's partly owned by the private sector who are silent investors and then partly by the u.s government and the way that it works is exactly like a commercial bank it's capitalized <laughs> From money from the private sector and then it goes on to the it's not the federal reserve producing the money it's actually the bank producing the money that is lent out just like every commercial bank does when it gives a loan u.s uh, uh corporation a uh, u.s uh banks uh create 90 percent of our money supply when they give loans like this and this one works the same way if you're interested there's a write-up on our uh website on how all the bank makes and creates money as it gives out loans 
Okay, thanks, Dr. May add to that. Uh, I'd like to to comment that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation made money for the taxpayers. It was self-sustaining from uh, the interest on its loans and the dividends on preferred stock that it bought. It was so profitable, in fact, that it helped fund FDR's spending programs like the PWA, the WPA. So it was initially funded by a, a grant from the government, but all that money was returned to the treasury plus a profit at the end of the Great Depression. Thank you. Our next questioner is Terrell Miller. Uh, hey guys, I'm from the uh, New York office of Senator Sanders. Uh, question, how does the bank correlate with everything going on in the cryptocurrency space? Is that damaging or is that something that it's going to be helpful? Uh, so I could take that one as well. Uh, <laughs> cryptocurrencies don't enter into the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, this is through, this bank operates through the US dollar and creates US dollars when it gives out loans. Uh, and it complements the, as far as the federal government goes and its spending and state and local governments, it complements all of that by providing the additional money that's not being funded for infrastructure so far. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Ah, Ruth Fruland from Seattle. Why not? Um, well, uh, we've passed this uh, bipartisan um, infrastructure uh, bill, and apparently it kind of diverts things away from green energy, more towards hydrogen that you get from all the fossil fuels. So. Um, there's that, but is there any relationship um, worth developing, uh, reaching out to uh, the people involved with that? Do they, where are they going to get their money from for their infrastructure projects? Thank you. So the, the, the money that's being provided under the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law comes from the budget. Uh, it's only going to give an additional 500 or so billion extra money more than it uh, that more than it appropriated the, over the last the previous five year period. And 500 billion of new money is not anywhere near enough. We need five trillion. And so that's why the National Infrastructure Bank will come in and complement that bill and add on to provide to totally top up the total amount of money we need. We need a trillion for just for high speed rail. We need 700 billion for affordable housing. We need water projects in the Southwest to address drought. If we don't fix that problem, we're gonna have no food supply, no food supply in the United States. So all of these things are really truly critical and we need to top up the money the National Infrastructure Bank will lend and promote the manufacturing sector at the same time. Thank you. Uh, we have two other people that have questions that have their hands raised. But before we go to those two, I would like to ask uh, Alan Green, a former representative from St. Louis, to speak briefly. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I know I need to be quick. I just wanted to uh, say that I fully support this particular uh, coalition that we're doing here with the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, actually, I'll be talking about some of this in Chicago on uh, May the 10th, the infrastructure bill. And uh, one of the pieces that fits so close to this as we're talking about now is that that infrastructure bill does not cover everything we need in the United States. It doesn't cover the rural areas. It doesn't cover suburban urban areas. It just doesn't. But the minority participation piece is a strong strong piece that's close to my heart here too. And since we don't have enough time to cover all of that and more, I just want to say I truly, truly, truly support this coalition. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Weber. Um, I really see this as it should be a bipartisan uh, effort. This is something that helps you, I think, our, our communities, no matter what our political party has, our, is. However, that being said, um, I am quite involved with local Democrats in Washington state. And I was just wondering 
are the, is there anything on the state level that we can do um, perhaps by um, getting a resolution through at our uh, summer delegate meeting or is there anything we can ask our state legislature to do to uh, move this forward? I don't know if you want me to answer that, um, uh, Linda, sure. but that's that's what that's what we did in Pennsylvania. We're continuing to uh, uh, try to promote it. We're trying to get the members. We it is bi bipartisan, by the way. We do have Republicans and Democrats on it, uh, but uh, we we need our speaker and the uh, the leader of the other side to be able to bring that up for a vote. You want to make sure that uh, you reach out to your uh, political. Uh, representation that you have in your state, because uh, that demonstrates to the national congressmen and senators that there's an interest, a high interest in your state. That's why we're going all over the United States, getting someone from every single state to, first of all, understand the process and then uh, buy into it and then get on board. Uh, I think it was said before, but if it wasn't, it's been done four times. This is not the first time we're doing it. Roosevelt, Hoover, Lincoln, Washington. It's time again to do it. So believe me, I think that once you uh, once you reach out to uh, some of your members that uh, want to make sure your roads are fixed or you have good water, clean water, take the lead out of your pipes. Broadband's a big issue in Pennsylvania. We have about 800,000 Pennsylvanians that don't have broadband. It eliminates telehealth, telehealth um, communications, business-wise, et cetera, let alone the uh, bridges, roads, and rail. So definitely uh, reach out to your representatives. And by the way, I'll be more than happy to uh, to connect with you. If you decide you want to have uh, another representative from another state, talk to them. More than happy to do that. Thank you. Thank I'd, you. Also, I'd also like to address that as well, Lisa. Um, we've actually had a number of uh, meetings with state representatives to help get a, a, a resolution passed by through the uh, Washington State Legislature. We're also having meetings with our congressional representatives. For example, on Monday of next week, um, we will have a group that's from here in Washington with about five or six people from Washington State, as well as people from other states, just like um, uh, the representative from Pennsylvania just talking about about how they support and why it's important. We're me actually meeting with one of our congressional persons uh, from the first uh, congressional district here in Washington State. So if you can help set up uh, meetings with legislators or with uh, your congressional people and you have contacts with them, we would really appreciate it. So I'm going to go to our last questioner. Joanne Tostivese. You're muted. Yes, we are related. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I had one question I want to just quickly follow up on the last thing is you've been talking about state and Congress. You also need to get your county represent, uh, legislators and your local legislators to pass resolutions that can then go to their state or federal associated legislative organizations that lobby in Congress to help out. Uh, we're doing that here in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's, uh, I think, about six cities and towns that have done it, about three or four counties that have then bounced it up to their state associations. A couple of state associations have done it. And they're now talking to some of the national related, like the League of Cities at the national level because of this local groundswell coming up. My question is, uh, a lot of this we've been talking about is a somewhat traditional infrastructure. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf has uh, passed a has uh, has a an executive order calling for uh, zero uh, energy uh, emissions by 2050. Local communities, including the one where I sit on council, uh, is having a, has climate action plans to work together in in coordination with everybody else. How can does and also Pennsylvania is one of the few states in 
in the country that has a state level infrastructure bank. That one is solely focused on transportation, something else you all might want to consider. But how can this National Infrastructure Bank work in conjunction with these climate action plans to not only improve our uh, uh, infrastructure in all these different areas, including housing and education and training, but also help re reach those goals of uh, uh, zero greenhouse gas emissions. So I can take that one as well, Alfa um, we, we The National Infrastructure Bank does have a climate plan. Uh, it differs a little bit from the standard climate plan that's being promoted right now, which is to move to electric vehicles and then move all of those uh, electric vehicles, um, essentially their power over to the uh, electricity grid. Um, that will not solve the traffic congestion problem. And it's also going to require quite a lot of investment to do it, th some $3 trillion just for that sole purpose. The way we're going to complement it is primarily by putting more rail into the transportation mix along the lines that Dr. Metcalf explained to you. If we can move more commuters and even express freight onto rail, we can lift all that traffic off of airplanes and uh, roads, which move, move things less efficiently than rail does. And um, that will pull down quite a lot of the largest emitter, which is the transportation sector. And then we also have some plans for the agriculture sector uh, to make investments there uh, and uh, to keep our eye on all the infrastructure inputs to make sure that we produce steel and cement. Cement is a large emitter of, it's the largest materials produce, uh, used in infrastructure and it, it's a big emitter and we will actually give loans for CO2 sequestering cement. So these are all kinds of things that we're also keeping our eye on uh, for, for the construction inputs to make sure our CO2 print, uh, footprint is at a minimum for bank projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I'm going to briefly ask Marilyn Chase, former senator from Washington State, to speak for one minute, and then uh, the same thing with Randy Bechtolt, and then we will uh, wrap it up. Oh, thank you, Linda. Um, just uh, to, to those, uh, uh, Lisa, I think you said you're from um, uh, Washington State. We have the the Democratic Party apparatus uh, going through right now. We have a, a new resolution uh, that we will be taking to the state convention. The reason we're doing these resolutions is that it is important. It is an important education tool. It is almost as important as as the film that I watched again today in preparing for Stephen's uh, talk tonight. Uh, Brother, can you spare a dime? I think we need to understand how this works. And I think that's a good, a really good uh, um, uh, film. I also would say that I, I think we need to um, address on these these um, programs the financialization of our economy and how, how you know how we're going to deal with that um, I you know I know that a lot of us want to do high speed high speed rail uh, but I, I I'm very concerned about getting more of the freight trucks off of the of the highways putting them on on rail and piggyback them across the country on rail. I think that that would do more for addressing what I think is not World War III, which Putin is over there working on, uh, but but uh, the climate change. I'm glad to see that this discussion brought out uh, the, the climate change and the greenhouse gas. We need to prioritize uh, uh, projects that will reduce the greenhouse gas and that will get freight off of our highways. Um, this, this is a very exciting thing. I know that our, we're, we're doing everything we can to get our congressional delegation on board with this. We're not having a lot of success yet, but we're working on it. So thank you, Linda. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Randy Bechtoff. Uh, hi again. Uh, one of the things we don't talk about with all with all the NIB is safety. An important part of, of creating all these jobs and all this infrastructure is we got to make sure that the people on the job are safety. 51 years ago today, OSHA went into effect. At AFL-CIO, we do we this April 28th is always Workers Memorial Day, where we honor the people honor the people that were hurt and, and killed on the job. And 
2020, 4,764 people were killed. Another 120,000 people were injured. And we've got to make sure that that's, we built this into it, that, that making these jobs, not only good jobs, good paying jobs, but safe jobs also. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if we could go to our last slide, we will wrap, up, wrap it up. So, as we were talking about before in Lisa's question about what can you do, one of the things you can do is call your member of Congress at 202-224-3121 and ask them to co-sponsor HR 339 for National Infrastructure Bank. And if you can call also your U.S. Senator and ask them to actually sponsor a similar bill in the U.S. Senate. And if you need additional information, we have some links that you can actually uh, go to at the nibcoalition.com website. Um, so take a note of these uh, websites and Facebook page or send an email to info at nibcoalition.com and we'll get back in touch with you. Thank you and have a good evening.